Okay, so uh, yeah, we have a pretty small team. Um, if I want to lay that out, we have uh, about two cartographers that are active in kind of maintaining our styles and our map templates. Um, we have a development team of three, uh, one of which currently only uh, works on the US Topo map production system. We're trying to uh, change that right now. So there, there's the kind of first nugget uh, of expert or advice, uh, n never let only one person develop a system. Um, and then we have a team of about uh, 12 editors that go through and do a, a lot of the QA work. So we're, we're a team of maybe about 20 total. So I'm first gonna talk a little bit about what the US Topo is. So the US Topo is uh, modeled after the old seven and a half minute uh, topographic map that we used to publish uh, between 1947 and 92. Um, this map series exists of uh, three different scales, uh, one to 20,000, one to 24,000, and one to 25,000 uh, for Puerto Rico, the lower 48 states, and Alaska. Uh, the, one of the biggest differences with the current US Topo uh, product is that it's really designed to be made for a mass production line. So all of our data sources are GIS driven. Um, a lot of the data is gathered either remotely or via federal, state, or local uh, partnerships. So it's a really big deviation from the way we used to uh, create maps through surveys. But it does enable us to, I'll say, join the modern age. So we're able to now produce uh, about a, a set of 55 to 60,000 maps on a, a three-year rotating cycle. So we're uh, publishing about 20,000 maps. I think the official number is around 18,000 maps per year to kind of maintain this currentness uh, of the, uh, the map line. Um, this map line did begin in 2009 uh, with kind of a prototype edition in 2008. Um, we started mapping Alaska and Puerto Rico in 2013. Uh, these maps are published digitally, not as paper maps anymore, um, as geospatial PDFs. Uh, this enables users to have some limited GIS functionality and kind of understanding uh, geospatial awareness uh, while interacting with the map, allowing kind of a, a dynamic uh, layering so folks can also turn some layers on and off as they need. But the digital documents also really enable us to do a lot of continuous improvement of the product o over the, the past decade. So we're able to continually improve and alter the maps. Um, this is kind of a, a snapshot of the, the content additions. Uh, adding content to the US Topo is actually a pretty tricky process. Um, we need to find data that is nationally consistent and authoritative, and I think uh, alone, just one of those things is a little tricky to, to do. Um, so I did have a, a map over in the uh, map poster gallery that kind of highlighted a, a timeline of when these uh, map, or the content was added to the US Topo. Um, we did hit a little bit of a, a lull recently in terms of the uh, uh, content additions, but this is uh, there are a lot of plans and roadmaps for us to really pick back up on, on the data that's going to be appearing in the US Topo over the coming years. Okay, so now let's shift into the, the real guts of this talk and kind of the, the map production system. Um, so in 2016, 2017, we completely uh, revamped our map production system um, our map production system was based on some code architecture from about 10, 12 years ago, so we had that much code debt. Over that time, we had about one developer always working on this, and we went through like three or four cycles of developers. Um, it, the code base was a couple hundred thousand lines of code, and it ultimately got to a point where the developers weren't able to maintain the code anymore because it was too cumbersome, and the turnover was too frequent. Uh, so coupled with this, we had a lot of third-party uh, software dependencies uh, that didn't always play along very well with ArcGIS technologies. So the uh, kind of technology became dated, um, servers were kind of left lingering, um, and we ultimately got into a lot of kind of security vulnerabilities on the uh, system. So this was really the biggest driver for uh, us migrating and kind of reimagining what the system uh, looks like. Uh, so these are some of the basic system requirements that need to enable us to meet and maintain the US Topo. Uh, we need to create about 25 to 30 maps an hour. Um, 
we, we had some headquarters people do the math on this, and they're like, Andy, you know, you know you can map the nation a couple times over with these numbers. And this is ultimately uh, to enable our production team to iterate on, on the maps as they're editing them, um, as well as kind of managing waves of production. So we can tend to hit you know, a week or a month uh, of no map production because we're working on other uh, data production activities. Uh, so when we do get that wave of demand, uh, we have to be able to scale and, and match that. We also need to maintain the, uh, the, the look and feel of the current US topo. Um, this uh, it involves requiring that geospatial PDF output, as well as having that PDF layered and organized uh, logically. Uh, the last thing is the map uh, needs to be generated across multiple scales and states. This was one of the uh, limitations of the old map production system and some of those software dependencies. Uh, some of the software that we used did not include um, UTMs 1 and 2, which prevented us from actually mapping some of Alaska. So we were able to kind of make sure that uh, we were able to truly map uh, globally with this new system. So uh, we uh, leveraged uh, the pod system. This is an Esri technology that leverages ArcGIS server uh, and a lot of ArcPy logic behind the scenes to manipulate and output a map. Um, I think these slides will be available, so at your leisure you can uh, go to that link, and it's actually uh, Esri's demo of the application over Salt Lake City. It's pretty cool. Uh, we worked really closely with Esri uh, across a couple of development contracts to customize um, this application to meet our business needs. Um, so the first uh, iteration was really kind of a proof of concept to see if this technology would really work for us. And then the second one was to kind of enable some production enhancements. So how we can uh, run maps concurrently, how the production users are able to queue up a, a set of maps for their uh, production activities. And we also wanted to uh, implement this in the cloud. Um, so we needed uh, the ability to be able to scale and alter the system pretty easily. Um, and we also have a long-term vision of actually being able to turn the system to be uh, public facing so that um, you guys, anybody, uh, can actually go to the system, create your own map in, in real time so you can access the most current data and potentially even have off-grid maps. So, you know, it's kind of the stereotypical thing, you know, our study areas always align on the boundary of, of one or more quadrangles. And this can potentially uh, eliminate that. So this is what the uh, system looks like. There's a couple ways uh, that we can interact with this. Uh, in this case, it's a single job uh, submission. So we kind of have two panes, the, the pane on the right and the left. The, the one is a, uh, just a, a base map that has our seven and a half minute uh, cell grid uh, overlaid with it. And this is actually dynamic. It's a feature service hosted through ArcGIS server. Um, and once a, a user clicks on that, it will create this kind of, uh, I don't know, cart. Uh, that has all the products that have been uh, selected. There's a lot of tools and utilities that help users select one or multiple or actually rearrange and kind of structure how, how that grid looks um, within this uh, queue system. Uh, the user would export the product and ultimately once that 82% down at the bottom reaches 100, it will change into a hyperlink that is kind of time locked so that the user is able to grab that um, but not completely clog up our servers. Uh, so right now, these maps take about 25, 30 minutes to export a piece. And again, so if we really think about how we need to maintain that 25 to 35 maps per hour uh, rate, we have to be able to really scale these and run these concurrently. Um, our production staff mainly uses uh, a, a batch job submission. Uh, so they store all of their AOIs in text files. Um, they're actually able to upload that text file into the system and it's able to kind of automatically parse that out into the, their working uh, area. Um, and it will load it into a, a queue where a user is able to watch and observe uh, as the jobs are accepted into the system and then as they progress and complete through it. Um, we, we have times where the, the system gets really loaded up. I, I think they ran all of California in like the first two and a half weeks of September. So we get these like crazy big uh, backlogs. Um, and this 
allows a, a user um, just to kind of go in, check the status of a job, talk to us and the development team if they're starting to see things fail and we're able to kind of troubleshoot, but also make sure that they're being communicated as to when they can say, okay, my job is done, I can go QA this, um, and make sure that we can uh, publish this with good eyes on it. So we have a couple levels of, of being able to really dig into the, the content. Um, the, the table on the bottom is the same one on the previous slide. We're actually able to interact with that table and uh, effectively explode more information out of it. So on the bottom we see kind of the job level detail and kind of the, the percentages uh, of how the, the job overall is progressing. Um, the top table actually shows uh, individual maps and how they're going through the system, who's submitting them, when they're starting, how long they're taking, stuff like that. All right, so this is the architecture. Um, this is all hosted in the cloud. Uh, each one of these boxes that we see um, are an individual server that's hosted in the cloud. Um, this is actually something that we're going to be working on and iterating through this year, but this is the way it currently exists. Um, a, a user who's over there on the left working on, on their workstation is able to log into the, uh, the web front end, which is that application I was just showing on the previous slide. They actually authenticate through Portal for ArcGIS, which integrates pretty seamlessly with ArcGIS server, and it's able to hook up to our Active Directory. So we kind of have this layer of security and also a couple of ways that we can start to define roles and groups so that our production users are able to do more within the system than a general user. Um, as stuff uh, comes in from the web server, it's sent to the backend worker servers, which again is all ArcGIS server and Python based. Uh, this kind of iterates and creates those maps. Uh, right now we have it set up so each server is running uh, 16 maps in concurrence. So that's able to make that about 30 maps an hour. Um, as jobs are completed, they do get sent to an S3 storage bucket, which then sinks back down locally to our on-premise uh, QA environments. Um, right now, these are all really kind of static servers. Um, this is something that we're looking at, how we can work with scaling ArcGIS server um, in a, a Python and ArcPy kind of environment. Um, so if anybody has a kind of experience scaling um, Esri products in the cloud. I'm really interested to talk to you guys. Uh, this is the behind the scenes. This is the, the little green script here really represents uh, what that backend server is doing. So as products are being sent and submitted through the uh, web front end, they go into this batch database, which then kind of queues them up as, as server space is, is available. Um, the map generator process uh, is kind of a really three-step process. Uh, it does the map configuration, so this uh, kind of pans the area uh, of interest into the map frame. It, um, I, I have in my notes it applies cartographic settings to GIS data, which is uh, kind of just fancy talk for saying it connects data in an arc map document. Um, and it uh, configures all of the map marginalia. So we have on uh, page uh, map citations, uh, the title, the adjoining quadrangle diagram, so it kind of is manipulating all of that marginalia uh, on the fly. Uh, we're also creating a map specific uh, metadata. Um, so we're able to look at the data and the content within the map and actually be able to say, okay, here is the, the edit or the production dates of, of this data, opposed to being able to only say, well, that data nationally is about this old. Um, so we're really able to kind of hone in on, on the currentness of the actual data that's being displayed. Uh, the map generation is exporting uh, to a geospatial PDF. So this is leveraging uh, the uh, production mapping extensions uh, PDF export. We actually needed to do this uh, and we actually worked really closely with Esri at kind of enabling us to do this. Um, so when you export a ArcMap document to a PDF and you have transparencies and rasters, it kind of smush all, smushes all into one. And this uh, production mapping extension is actually able to export layers individually. So we're able to retain those raster layers as well as the transparent layers in the PDF uh, export. Um, it's also going to attach the metadata to the, the PDF directly as well as a legend uh, of the US topo. And then finally, the map storage and delivery. Again, this is sending things to an S3 repository, syncing down to our local environment um, where editors are able to QA that and then send it back out to the cloud for final dissemination. 
So we have a really big uh, focus on configurable components. Uh, right now we have six uh, ArcMap templates that kind of help manage uh, our uh, marginalia and content. This is something that we're hoping to eliminate and reduce. Um, we're hoping that we can get these six MXD templates down to uh, two MXD templates. Uh, we have to retain uh, MXD templates for Puerto Rico and the rest of the US at a minimum because uh, we, we've found through creating uh, Puerto Rico that th there's a, a language barrier. And we need to uh, really be kind of honing in on um, making our label queries specific to the Spanish language so that we can create a, a satisfactory looking map. I'm gonna skip over this. Uh, again, this is something else that we've really tried to enable. Uh, this is how we're able to control the layering. So when we export a PDF out of ArcMap, we get all of the ArcMap layers. Uh, we work really closely with Esri to kind of create this configurable process that's able to read an XML and actually restructures, reorders, and groups the, the PDF into something uh, much more logically that we want. Uh, we do use an agile process. This is kind of the, the pitch that I have to give <laughs> that gets me here. Um, so we work in kind of a really iterative process. Uh, it's really agile process, but I like to call it a water scrum fall approach um, because it, in the government, we, we have to do waterfall planning. <laughs> but we still try to be agile and really kind of iterative and kind of making sure that we're controlling the expectations of our development. Um, here are some links to the first map out of this new system. These were uh, June 2017. We actually focused in Alaska, which was a really big kind of thorn for the old system. So we were able to create all of that fiscal year's um, Alaska mapping within pretty much the last two months of the fiscal year because we were able to slide this new system into place just in time. Uh, future goals, um, we're looking at re-architecting the whole system. We're trying to expand to more scales and effectively increase the uh, product line or expand the product line of US Topo into different kind of use cases and scales. That's really all I had. I sorry, I had to kind of rush through those last couple ones. Are there any questions? Yeah. I will make them available online. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So all of them are included within the same PDF. When I showed those three tiles, it's actually me just changing the visibility of layers in the PDF. Yeah, so the 30 minutes of the whole E to Z process. Thank you. Our last speaker.